The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. In this episode of Postcards... I was the last of the family to take care of my mother and sort out 200 years of family things that had been stored in 18 rooms for a hundred and some years. Initially we became an LLC, just, and then throughout the fall of 2007 we were trying to figure out what was the best way for us to operate. And we learned that being a, becoming a cooperative is probably going to work best. I like to paint animals. I love to paint nature. Uh, it's all divine to me, so bringing out that divineness in matter is what counts for me. I, I love the beauty. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center. Your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota, a relaxing vacation or great location for an event. Explore Alex.com. Easy to get to, hard to leave. Join us for a tour of the Prospect House, a family home full of history, including hundreds of artifacts from the Civil War. This is the Prospect House, now the Prospect House Museum. My great-grandfather, Cap, Captain James A. Kohlauer, moved here in 1882 to join his best friend, Mr. Everts, and start the lumber yard. On his way here, he thought that this would be a good place for a summer tourist resort. That was in 1882, and then he started it in 1886. He was every bit an entrepreneur. He arranged a with the local people so that he had a full service tourist hotel with uh, guides, boat service, bait, guns, dogs, you name it, uh, food, uh, good sleeping rooms, the, the best accommodations around for sure. The Prospect House has been in the family for four generations and uh, my great grandfather started it in 1882 and then it was passed on to his daughter and then from her it was passed on to her daughter, and that is my mother. And after her father died in 1970, they moved in, and, and she started working immediately on just keeping it original and restoring it to the original shape as much as possible. I don't really know why. She was just, uh, that was her passion, to keep her family home that she was born in and died in, keep it... Uh, uh, for everyone to enjoy, I guess. My mother had dementia and kidney failure and her mind was going and I was the last of the family to take care of my mother and sort out 200 years of family things that had been stored in 18 rooms for a uh, hundred and some years and uh, I just started working on it while I was taking care of my mother. Uh, it was a huge job. So I started in uh, the third floor library up there where I guess you, actually the whole third floor was just a huge storage area piled solid with about five foot deep stuff from one end to the other. And I spent six weeks in the library, every day, all day for six weeks. Now I went into the next uh, old room that was uh, one of the bedrooms in the old hotel when it was the first tourist hotel in town. And uh, that room was full of antique women's clothes, and I really didn't want to get into that. And then I went into the next old bedroom, and in that room I opened up, up a trunk and found a chest with nearly 200 Civil War letters in it. 
And then I started to find Civil War things all over the house, and that got me re-enthused into sorting out this mess. Uh, and now I've been working on it for 14 years. Cap and his brother David enlisted together in the Civil War. He volunteered. Uh, he fought to preserve the Union. That's what he was all about. That was his idea of patriotism. And then he fought for a full three years in the Civil War. He was Sherman on his march to the sea. He was shot through the right shoulder in the bloodiest two-day battle of the Civil War, Chickamauga, with 35,000 casualties in two days. And then he ended up being one of the two oldest men in Ottertail County when he died, as well as being mayor, and mayor of Battle Lake and Justice of the Peace. Uh, but after the Civil War, life was just wonderful for him because he survived the worst things that you could possibly imagine. And I think that's why he lived so long. This is probably one of the most fascinating things in the house. It's a letter from the surgeon describing my great-grandfather's bullet wound through his left shoulder. My great-grandfather wrote right on top of it, blood from wound received at Muscle Shoals, January 25th, 1864. That's Cap's blood on that letter. And over here is his uh, sleeves to his uniform with bullet holes in each shoulder where he was shot. Letters that he got when he was in the hospital with typhoid fever. He nearly died there. And there's even a bottle of typhoid fever serum. They're kind of hard to find these days. This is him holding his Civil War rifle, and here it is right here, and his brother David's sword. Uh, the blue stuff on the handle is shark skin. And when... Uh, David died in Nashville of typhoid. Cap sent his sword home with uh, David's body, and Hiram, another brother, picked up the body and the sword and headed home, caught typhoid fever himself, and died two weeks later. Uh, this bedroom has got all of my great-grandparents' things in it, and one of the more unusual things is this coverlet down here. It, it's actually a burial shroud from the Civil War and it very likely wrapped Cap's brother David in it. Uh, it's very valuable and very delicate. It's got cotton threads going one way, wool threads going the other way, and the proper way to clean it is to hang it on a clothesline during a snowstorm. Cap was real good about riding home to his mother and his sister and his brothers. He didn't want to get them too alarmed about how bad things were. Uh, out there on the battlefields. David, however, wasn't quite as good. I've got his original Civil War letters here before he died. My dear mother, since last I wrote you, you perhaps have been wondering where we are, but this will set you at ease in that regard. Well, that's pretty nice. Then down here he says, It was a terrible sight. I have seen a good many sad and fearful sights since in the army, but none so disgusting or repulsive as this. The rebels lay piled up in heaps, feet and heads together, and with no more regard to order than if they were slaughtered hogs. Some without arms, some without legs, some headless and in all shapeless forms and conditions. Those shot with a rifle, most of them were shot through the head or chest, and many I noticed were shot through the eyes. Some were blown all to atoms. One we noticed had his hands shot off, shot through the head, his leg shot off twice, and shot through the heart. David, you're riding home to your mother. A month later, he was dead. This is one of the most special things I've found in the collection uh, in the Civil War Museum. My great-grandfather and my grandmother saved everything to do with Lincoln, and this is an 1864 campaign poster that was hanging on a telephone pole or, well, I guess, telegraph pole before Lincoln was elected. Uh, this is one of the earliest things I found to do with the Civil War, and I immediately framed it in UV glass and put it aside so that it would be preserved. This is a glass plate negative from the Civil War of a couple of Cap's Civil War buddies. It's a negative on glass, and you develop it by putting a background on it. So without the background, it, they don't have any clothes on. 
and now they do. Basically, the house is just a collection of memories. Everything in that house has some memory attached to it. Uh, we weren't r collectors, we just saved memories. And when I found that chest and found the Civil War letters in it, of course I knew they were old letters. And then I started figuring out what they were and, you know, I was really confused at the start because you don't expect to find a hundred and some Civil War letters anymore. It's got to be one of the largest finds in the United States in the last 40 years. Uh, 300 Civil War artifacts is pretty, pretty unusual in today's world. My family has always enjoyed uh, picture puzzles and uh, we're pretty good at it and this is just like a giant picture puzzle and, and my family has also always been interested in history and archaeology and, uh, and uh, it seems like no matter which box full of stuff you pick up there's always a little gold nugget in there somewhere and it just keeps you going and going and going. It's, it's, uh, it's like a giant picture puzzle with pieces missing or lost all over the place and you keep finding, I got another one, I know where this goes. And you put it over there with the other half of the whatever it is. Do you use Facebook, Twitter, or other social media? Connect with us to get immediate access to behind-the-scenes videos, reviews, and other postcards and pioneer news. The Morris Movie Theater not only has had a rich history, but is also a compelling story of community involvement. Theater ranks as one of the finest in this section. Modern equipment, rich furnishings, and decorations. Feature theater. Okay, the Morris represents one of the largest building jobs undertaken in the city in many years and is a noteworthy addition to the city. Well, the Morris Movie Theater has a really long history in Morris. It's been um, in its present location since 1940, and people would go to the movies all the time. It was a big, it was a big event to go to movies. You know, it was always sold out. There's a lot of pictures in the collection of people standing in line in front of the movie theaters, in, this, in front of the Morris Movie Theater. One of the first movies I remember going to, I was about seven years old, and we stood in line around the block to get into the movie, and of course the movie was a very popular one. It was Gone with the Wind. Um, long movie, um, all the seats were full, including up in the balcony, and I've been fascinated with the movie theater ever since then. The woman in this picture is Ruth Darling, who was born and raised here in Morris, Minnesota. And these diary entries are from a period of time from 1942 to 1947, while she went to the Morris Theater. November 29, 1942. Abbott and Costello, in Pardon My Sarong, had Mother and I just doubled over today. The theater was packed. People gave up dignity to shove for a place in line. I also think that it's um, got a lot of memories for people, people who have remained in the area. And I think it's a, still a gathering place to a certain extent that people like to see remain in their community. In Morris on Atlantic Avenue, there were two smaller theaters. And they were in competition until this guy came to Morris. And his name was St. Boniface James Benfield and he was known as Bonnie, and Bonnie was an interesting character. He smoked cigars and you know, had the cool fedora hats and things like that, so anyway. So he, he bought the two theaters, and uh, then he, in 1937, he started talking about building a new one. Okay, 
The theater has a capacity of 811 patrons, nearly 300 more than the capacity of the Strand. In the balcony, in addition to the patron seats, are located the projection booth, a crying room where parents of fretful children might take the youngsters and still be able to see and hear the show, though other patrons will be undisturbed. It used to be uh, called a crying room. So back when people would come, the whole family would come to the movies in the 40s and 50s and 30s, um, you'd bring your kids, and sometimes your kids would cry, and that would bother people. So they would come up here to this room, and I'm afraid it's covered up, but there's a glass window there behind that styrofoam and speakers. So you could sit up here, and your babies would howl, and Mom would enjoy the movie that way. <laughs> and Dad and the kids would be downstairs, or vice versa, if it was a less sexist family. It was between keeping it as a movie theater or it turned into a church. It was just a last minute meeting that was called. We knew that we wanted to save the movie theater because we wanted to keep first run movies in Morris. And I said initially we became an LLC just uh, and then throughout the fall of 2007 we were trying to figure out what was the best way for us to operate and we learned that being a, becoming a cooperative is probably going to be work best for getting lots of members. Most small clown theaters are individually owned. We're the one part unique is the fact we're cooperative and we have member and we're member driven and we need a lot of member support. We took over our first goal was to pay off and own the theater. And within the first year, we actually paid off the $115,000 we'd taken out loans to buy the theater. And then we wanted to try and do some renovations. Uh, we hoped to do eventually to get multiple screens. We want to keep the character of the theater. The 1939-1940 Art Deco Streamline Modern. And the even more original 1930s carpet. And the exterior was a little bit in, in tough shape. Uh, the stucco was falling off, it had gotten water damage. Uh, the windows were some of them were bad shape. Uh, the vitrolite, which is that kind of glass, if you look in the exterior, it's kind of that glassy ceramic kind of thing. That was a Material was popular back in the 30s and 40s, maybe the early 50s, for movie theaters and a lot of downtown businesses like restaurants and so forth. So kind of a shiny material, and we had a lot of those pieces were broken, and they don't they stopped making that stuff in the 1950s. We also had glass blocks out there were broken, the decorative glass blocks, and then we had the neon was all broken, so we had the company come in from Alexandria, and repaired our neon lights and our marquee lights and got the building painted, we got the stucco repaired. So now we've got the outside of the theater looking very much like it would have when it was first built. In Morris, we have lost a lot of our, uh, you know, the physical history, the, the older buildings and so on. And so uh, this is a, a really fun building for a town like this. And it was one I wanted to keep going, but mostly, um, I, I want the movies in town, and I'm willing to, you know, do my bit to help out. It's fun. It's just an asset for the community, and it really helps every other business in town because if people are going out of town to go to the movies, whether it's taking their kids or they want to go see a movie or whatever, they're taking their business out of town too. I wanted people to be able to have a place that they could bring their children to see the movies because I have four grandchildren. I wanted them to be able to go see cool movies and to be able to just go to my local movie theater. Support your local movie theater. Come and see the movies with us. We'd love to have you. Thank you. Enjoy the show. Do you have an idea for the postcards team? Email us, postcards at pioneer.org. Artist Marcella Rose expresses her passion for nature through the mediums of painting and metalwork design.
My name is Marcella Rose. I'm an artist. I paint, sculpt, and design jewelry. And I live in Pelican Rapids, Minnesota. I like to paint animals. I love to paint nature. Uh, it's all divine to me, so bringing out that divineness in matter is what counts for me. I, I love the beauty of it, and I like listening to the messages. I'm completely in the moment, and I just look at the image and, let, and put some paint on there and watch it happen. Basically, I just kind of let it come through because I don't have any preconceived idea. I can't paint buildings. I can't paint fence posts. I can't paint anything that's man-made for some reason. It's like that old thing about I can't draw a straight line. Can't do it. No, I, I got to stick with something that's breathing and living and alive. As a little girl, I've always, I've always drawn. I started out drawing horses, actually, and I started doing fashion illustration and. Uh, just went into advertising illustration, but I always kept my love for doing anything with nature, so I always did that. Here we have Compassion. It's a pelican. I was inspired as soon as we moved up here to Pelican Rapids. Uh, pelicans are very compassionate animals as they will actually um, save, their, save their young by taking their own life. Um, then we have Promise of Glory, a loon. I hear them every day, off and on all day long. We have a little family living right out front here. Blue heron, of course, they're all over around here. The water birds are abundant. Uh, the trumpeter swans are out front, especially in the spring. Uh, this piece right here is a, it's a diptych of just, um, just spirit, just pure spirit. It's called Renew and Recharge. Unattached observer in this world, not of it, journey beyond opposites, the language of transcendence. Sincerity, honesty, enthusiasm, tenderness, goodness and grace, abundance of life. I do write for my paintings a lot of times. It's just like whatever comes through to me once the artwork is done. And it's usually in a prose format because I don't call myself a writer, but it just kind of comes through. So yeah, I usually include that on the, you know, on the back of an, an article or uh, on my website. Yeah, I eventually like to put a book together and then put everything in there. I love to design jewelry. It, it just feels like fine art that lasts for a very long time. I can cast in silver or gold. Um, this particular pendant, Embrace the Fire Within, which I'm wearing right here, is all about empowerment. It's, it's a symbol of inner strength and passion. Uh, it's like a tactile affirmation, basically. You can feel it with your hand. It was made to, to hold right there. Um, so that's Embrace the Fire Within. Then I have Radiance, which is like a little star, which is basically the same symbol times four. It's, it's like for the four directions, uh, four seasons. Um, it's representative, representative of consciousness, creativity, compassion, and cooperation. And that I have in a pendant and in earrings. Every, all of my jewelry is sculpted in wax and cast in silver or gold. I just started playing with wax one day and melting it with a hot tool, and I loved the feeling of it. It was, again, a lot like the oil paints, just very fluid and, and lifelike. Uh, I could get some very interesting interesting things in it so I just kept doing it I just started doing it on my own and then I did take a small course in casting to learn how that was done I found out that that's not something I want to do so I actually hired that out uh, but uh, the actual design and uh, creation of the piece is my own 
and I self-taught there. And this is a portrait of Bobby V. Uh, I was invited to be part of the Invitational at the Rourke Museum last year, and the, uh, the theme was the American Songbook, so it was just a no-brainer for me to paint Bobby V since I listen to him all the time. Uh, so then when I, I painted it and I contacted the V family, they suggested that I bring it over and that they could see it. And uh, Bobby loved it so much that he actually signed it for me, so this is his signature. people to be inspired. I want people to uh, just see, see the divine in themselves by seeing it come through the painting, I think, because that's, that's what I'm trying to portray, and I just believe that if somebody's looking at that, they will pick up on the same feeling that I had, perhaps, when I was in the moment painting, um, and inspire them to do it fact that I, I do believe that we're all artists and most people don't seem to believe that but it's a way of life and when I'm painting I don't hear see feel anything else I'm just there and I believe that that is a connection with the divine I would like them to have that same experience and find their own their own path their own excitement their own passion Have you missed a show you'd like to see? Pioneer On Demand has all of your favorite productions available to watch online at your convenience, including past episodes of Postcards. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yako Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center. Your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota, a relaxing vacation or great location for an event. ExploreAlex.com, easy to get to, hard to leave.